Okay, so first of all, we want to thank Patricia and that she's at the History Fort Lauderdale now and that she has done a, given local uh, um, authors this wonderful opportunity to participate and, sh and share their stories. So today we have a local author and published by a local publisher. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Yves Masson. As a young boy of the age of five, Y.A. Masson, Eves, struggled through four years of hardship under German occupation of Paris. Alain, who is the narrator of this somewhat biographical historical fiction narrative, is Eves himself. His ability to describe the daily fears, devastating hunger, and the despair of deprivation of himself and his young friends draws his audience into their conflict. We are grateful that he is here with us to tell his story. So when Paris was dark, this is the title of the book that he's gonna be talking about today, is his first book in the trilogy, he has a trilogy called The Demons of War. And it follows this, this young person through um, his life. So I'm gonna turn this uh, over to Eves, who was there, and uh, he's going to tell you about it. So thank you, everybody, who helped me uh, get here. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about when Paris was dark. I'll tell you a bit about the story, and I'll read a few paragraphs to illustrate what I, uh, my points are, and then we'll have time for questions. When Paris was dark, that was during World War II. And you may be right to say that many books have been Parisian. And that is because the authors were not there at the time. I was. Also, most of the World War II stories are about battles, about courageous soldiers, Marines, aviators, sailors, general admirals, while others talk about destruction, about persecutions, deportation, feats of courage, and unspeakable death. When Paris was dark is about children, children in wars. The story is narrated by Alain, a young French boy who, like all children affected by war, did not know what the conflict was about. Neither he or his friends had any idea that they would be faced with this long conflict for more than four long years. Alain, Pierre, and Anne found out early that war is an adult thing, that adults do not like to talk to, to children about. They also discovered that they were not to expect any special treatment because they were children. They would suffer and they would die like everybody else. Maybe more important, importantly, one of the most important things that they learned from listening to their parents was that war leads to hate and hate leads to war. So the children who were petrified and scared of the German soldiers decided not to hate them. They just wanted them to go home. The three of them survived the war and to do so, to do so they had to learn how to do it. They grew up fast. They acted older than they were. They became streetwise. And at the end of the war, they were as tough as the adults who made them that way. That's what children in war have to say. So what is Alain's story? Alain will show the reader what his life was like. He was traced by Germans, German Stuttgart, like the one you saw and heard on the trailer. He saw people shot and others disappear. He was threatened by armed soldiers. 
He endured a life's bombing. He almost died of starvation. But more importantly, Alan shares the emotions he went through as the war robs him of his childhood. Let me read a few lines to describe how Alan's war started. Chapter one, line one. My mother and I were on our way to the bakery to get bread for lunch. All of a sudden, planes screamed down from the sky. They roared close to my head. Fire their guns, rose up, turned around, and seconds later came back and started to drop bombs. Mom, what's going on? I shouted, hanging out to her hand for dear life. I was not yet five years old. It's a German. We have to go back home, she shouted back. She tightened her grip on my hand and started to run. People hurried in every direction, looking for any kind of shelter. Our house was only a few blocks away, but roof tiles, tree limbs, broken glass, bricks and debris fell onto the pavement, making it difficult to run, even to walk. My ears, ears hurt from the high-pitched sirens of the diving bombers and from the blasts of the bombs. The flashes of the explosions blinded me. The ground shook. Smoke was everywhere. The air smell smelled like someone had struck a million matches. Then coming from over the rooftops, its siren blaring, a plane headed straight for me. Puffs of dirt coming up from the ground moved at lightning speed towards my feet. I panicked. I bolted. I tripped, I fell. My face hit something hard on the ground. I screamed, but nobody heard me. My face, my shirt, and my hands were dripping with blood. That was the introduction. Alan witnessed many atrocities, mostly that which affected strangers, like the people on the street, who were bombed by the bombers. But one day, Alain and his school friends found out that two of their schoolmates were Jewish and had a, gl a glimpse of what that the price they had to pay for that. Let me read about this event. One day toward the end of the first school year, Isaac came to school, his arm in a sling. What happened to you? I asked, pointing at his arm. He was very shy and said in a soft voice, I have a sprained elbow. How do you do that? This weekend, my dad and I were beaten by German soldiers. My dad has broken ribs and a black eye. I gasped. Did they really do that? Why? Did he insult them? No, we are Jewish. German people don't like us. They called us dirty Jews. How did you know they were, you were Jewish? I had no idea. We had to re register earlier this year. That's how I found out that Isaac and Sarah were Jewish. I turned to the teacher, Madame Duval. Her face was ashen, her lips were trembling, but she tried to project a calm and understanding image. Why does anybody care if they're Jewish? Madame Duval looked at me, her jaw tight. She said, all of you, please listen. The laws of the government forbid the Jewish people to go to certain places, to buy certain things, and to conduct several types of business. The Jewish people are being persecuted everywhere the Germans are. Her face was tense as she was speaking. She was visibly upset. Alain, I think we need to, do, to find out more about this. I'll ask my father, Pierre said to me. You're right, I'll ask mine too, I said. We all wanted to know more. We were going to ask our parents and compare notes the next day. I was hoping for a better explanation than Madame de Vance. When I got home, I told my mother what happened and asked for her why the Jews are being persecuted. I was hoping for a better answer than Madame de Valls. Alan, I know very little about this. I know 
Some Jewish businesses have been closed by the German authorities. Some places are off limit to Jewish people. But beyond that, I don't know why. I have no idea what else is going on. Maybe I can ask dad when he comes home. He may know more, I said. Alain, you need to know and you better remember it. Like many people, your father does not like the Jews. So don't talk to him about them. Dad doesn't like the Germans. The Germans don't like the Jews. And he doesn't like either. I don't get it. Well, that's the way he is, my mom said. Yeah, and he just doesn't like me either. He never hurts me. Mom, if dad doesn't like Jews, do you? I have no opinion. I have other things to worry about. And granddad? I don't know. He's such a gentleman. He probably has no reason not to like them. Later that year, the seven-year-old twins were violently taken away from our classroom, never to be seen or heard of ever again. You may wonder if there is a light motive that constantly reminds the reader of the hardship of the war. There is. The theme, the essence of when Paris was dark is fear. Alain and his friend lived with several fears every day. They went to sleep with the fears and walked with them in the morning. What fears, you may ask? Fear of being buried alive by Allied bombs. Fear of armed enemy soldiers teeming everywhere. Fear of being arrested, taken away, and be lost forever. Fear of being shot in a Rwanda or in one of the many random German checkpoints. And of course, fear of starvation, which came with physical torments, but also the unexpected insidious emotional pain of hunger. This happenings beg the question, where did Alain find the strength to stand up to the very everyday threats, restrictions, and coercion? Because Alain proved to be unhelpful, he had to find support outside of home. So he built a world of his home. He made special friends, adults who were on the children's side and gave him protection and support. In addition to Pierre and Anne, Alain's special friend included Sister Mary, a nun, who swore she would always help him no matter what. Mimi, a young prostitute whom he talked to every day on his way home from school, and who shared the apples and oranges her German customers sometimes gave her. Madame Dulac, the baker's wife, who gave him bread when he desperately needed it and Madame Leblanc, his third grade teacher, who gave him the support and love he didn't get at home. You may ask, how did this special world of him help him? Let me give you a couple of examples. On a fateful day late in 1943, a high-ranking German official was shot by a French partisan in Paris. As promised by von Scholitz, the general in charge of the German troops in the city, hostages were immediately taken to be shot at their reprisal. That afternoon, one block from his school, Alain was held with 50 men and women. 50 hostages were killed that afternoon in the south of Paris. But Alain and his group were released after an hour an hour which felt like an eternity to Alain, who waited for death to come out of the black round holes he stared at at the end of the German rifles aimed at him. Terrified, he made up his head that he would escape, run under the German truck in back of him and run to sister Mary's clinic, only a couple of blocks away. But he didn't. He froze. He felt bad about it. The next day, his teacher, Madame Leblanc, praised him for his courage. And on his way home, 
he stopped to see Sister Mary, who confirmed if she would have hidden him and saved him, and promised she would do it any time, although wishing she would never have to. Another example, let me read about this. Like every day on my way home, I turned up on a Ripley Gar. I was looking forward to talking to Mimi. On the corner, there were two armed German soldiers that had never happened before. They looked at me, but didn't say anything. My stomach tightened up, tightened up instantly. I walked on. When I turned my head back to look at the soldiers, I saw they were blocking my way. Mimi was there as, as usual. As I got near her, she waved to me to hurry. Alain, Les Bosch, at a checkpoint up the street. Will you be okay going through it? They have guns, you know. If you want, you can come inside me, inside with me. You would be safe. They won't come in here. Mimi knew about my being held up at gunpoint a few months ago, and she was concerned. I was afraid I would not want to be confronted with rifles again. Thanks, Mimi. I don't mind the soldiers. I have ID and my papers are in order. As I was starting to walk up the street, there was a commotion. German soldiers shouted, Halt! The fort! Zoe! Schnell! Two young men started to run towards the street, to, down the street toward where we were standing. Mimi grabbed me and pulled me inside. The men didn't stop. Several shots were fired. One of the two men fell. The other one fled onto a side street. After a while, I said to Mimi, that was close. Thanks so much. I could have been caught in the crossfire. I owe you my life. So the war for Alain and his friends did end. As D-Day was approaching, and you know, we celebrated the 77th anniversary of D-Day last Sunday, rumors about an Allied landing in northern France were abundant, but real information was unavailable, even on D-Day. The German control radio did not report the landing, and Parisians did not know it had happened. Only the ones who braved the German edict not to listen to the BBC learned the truth from Sir Winston Churchill late that evening. But the Parisian had to wait almost three more months before Paris was liberated. During the Battle of Paris, once again, Alan's life was threatened, this time by a German Tiger tank, but he made it through. One afternoon, the bells of all of the churches of Paris told to tell him he was free. That joyful melody made him cry. A couple of days later, Alain Pierre went to greet the liberators. And let me tell you about that wonderful day. The next day, I met Pierre, and we went further west toward the Champs-Élysées. We saw a column of, of column of American tanks parked at the Place de la Concorde. The tanks were smaller than the Tiger tanks that I got to know too well. There were dozens of them. Some of the American soldiers were on the sidewalk, others were sitting on the tanks smoking. The young men were tall and strong, and they seemed to laugh a lot. They looked at us and waved their arms, telling us to come to them. Do you know any word of English? I asked Pierre. Not one. Somehow, the Bosch only told us German, he said, laughing. We walked toward a group of soldiers. They greeted us and said something which we did not understand. Then one patted me on the back, reached in his pocket, and gave me a bar of chocolate. Then he said, Candy. Merci, I replied, and I repeated, candy. The DR laughed, put his hand out, grabbed mine, and shook it, 
friends, he said, pointing at him, himself, and at me. Friends, I said. Another GI lifted me up on his tank. He said something to me, which of course I did not understand. But so I put my hand out and said, friend. Yes, friend. He put his arm around my shoulders and talked to me for the longest time. I had no idea what he was saying to me, but it felt good. I loved listening to him. He was young, very strong, and yet so gentle. I was so glad those guys were on my side. He gave me two cans of meat and also a couple of rolls of life saver. I had never seen anything like it. It was so beautiful with all the white colors. Thanks, friend, I said. He pointed at himself and said, Bill. I pointed at myself and said, Alain. Wish you can. That was great. So in a way, this story is that of the thousands of children who were raised during the horrific times of World War II and survived in France, in Germany, Netherlands, Russia, Poland, Italy, Norway, Japan, England, Singapore, and all the countries where fighting and bombing took place during this conflict. Unfortunately today, all over the world, more children are victims of adult wars that they had nothing to do with. But the one who will survive will emerge wise and strong. And hopefully, one day, some of them will eradicate war. This is the story. All right, okay. All right, so um, what I was saying was, um, I would like you to talk a little bit more, expand on, you touched on it a little bit about hunger and um, the, the, not only the physical, but the psychological effects that that had on you as a child and all your friends and your family and how your mother dealt with it. Well, you know, when you have, when you're hungry, you, you know, you are never satisfied and sometimes you have pain in your stomach because you're needing food. But because of that, just the thought of food, just the idea of food, is, is in your mind all the time. And I had a little brother who was born in the middle of the war, he was a baby. And because of that, he had some special um, fruit and tickets for this and that, which I had no access to, of course. But, you know, in as much as he was my brother, I just could not stand it. My, my mind was, my mind was hungry. And just looking at it made me hungry, drop you crazy. So it is. So your mother, your, you, I know the story starts out when you and your mother are on the, the bakery to get bread, which later turned out to be not possible and not only bread. Um, what did she end up feeding her family? Well, what, I mean, like, you know, we never threw anything away. When we got potatoes, if we could get five you know, pounds of potatoes, or we'd just keep them as long as we could, and they would rot. And my, my mother would make soup with the rotten part, and we'd eat the non-rotten part, you know. And as as at first we had you know sufficient um, butter and stuff, and then butter was replaced by margarine, and margarine was replaced with lard, and lard was replaced with nothing. And at the end, before the, 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 during the Battle of Paris, we had scraps. And one day, I, know, I, I ran to the bakery and I got the, my, Miss, the baker's wife she gave me uh, stale bread. This is all I have. I'm not baking bread anymore. And, and I ran back home and, you know, and we put it in water to soak it up. You know, we were hungry. I mean, we were <laughs> hungry. And the hunger lasted a long time, way after the liberation. And as strong as you were, I think you ended up getting actually very sick because of uh, starvation. It made you very yeah, sick. I, I almost died. I mean, I had the uh, 
liver condition, which I don't know where it was, and uh, I could not tolerate any food. And as, as skinny as I was, uh, I just couldn't afford not to lose any more weight. But somehow um, uh, we tried everything, my mother tried everything and uh, boiled carrots saved my life because that's so, all I could. That was all you could yes. eat, her carrots. Yeah. So um, are Alain's friends still alive? Do you know anything about them, like Pierre? And I have Adrian? no idea, you know. Um, actually, and uh, we lost, and and did not come through, come back from, she went to uh, one summer to her grandparents, but it was, she, they were in the country, there was a bit more food, and she was so skinny that she stayed there the last year of school, and, uh, and, and so that was that. And then she, she uh, Pierre and I skipped the grade. So when she came back, we were not with her. And then that school I was in uh, didn't go beyond five, sixth grade. And so I went my way, Pierre went his way and I lost track of him. So do you, I know, I know that this is the first book in your Demons of War trilogy. And um, at the end of the war, Alan goes on another journey. Um, but do you think that there was, I know we talk a lot about PTSD as a child and what you went through, do you have any psychological damage from all that war and stress? No, I thought about that a lot. And because when, after this, my war in Nigeria, when I was, fighting the, the war was a participant and not a victim. Uh, I got PTSD and I wonder why I had nothing after the first world war. First of all, I was young. And two, you know, the, the thing that we did not want to hate the German uh, really stuck with us. And, uh, you know, the only damage to my brain was that I have claustrophobia spending nights in that uh, uh, dark cellar with, and hearing bombs and that kind of stuff. I can't stand being, you know, in a dark place, you know, like, you know, I've traveled a lot and all the places where they have caves or grottoes, don't ask me to go in because I won't. It just, but it's about, you know, the sound of heavy uh, airplanes I don't like. But they have no nothing. I mean, it really came out. I was lucky. Mm -hmm. it, would, would anybody else like to ask a question? Anybody out there? Well, I have a couple other comments. It's like I love I love that your very first English word was candy. That's right. <laughs> and that the okay. second one was friend. That just really touched me. And actually, candy was my first word, and that's the first candy I had in four years. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to just read a little bit of a reader re reader view. If there's any authors out there that are looking for somebody to review their book, reader views is awesome. I mean, they're they're upfront. They do a, um, honest review. There's no fee. Um, they're really, really, really up upright. Um, reviewers. And so they say about When Paris Was Dark, it's particularly poignant because it presents readers with a realistic scenario of a young, ch young child living through a devastating and dan dangerous war. In essence, the further they read into the story, the more that this child's innocence is taken away. For kids growing up in World War II, the growing up has to happen pretty fast. And it's like what Eve said, that they were pretty grown up by the time this war ended. Maison's book fits nicely in today's climate because for kids like Alain during the war, changes happen gradually and drastically all at the same time. Normalcy was shattered and suddenly every day seemed like something to fear. I think this is something lots of readers will be able to identify with today in regards to COVID and all the drastic changes we have had to make daily to our lives and our traditions. So, um, we thank you for being here. We're glad you survived so many um, terrible things. And um, 
it was just a pleasure to publish your book and to read your book. And I hope that, that everybody else will um, enjoy it as well. There's another question in the chat, guys. So it's uh, from Tammy, uh, Tammy Alvarez, and she asks, can uh, Eve discuss his other books and what they explore? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, the second book of the trilogy is uh, called, titled, The War Inside His Mind. And it's the same protagonist, Alain, but at this time, he's uh, in his 20s, uh, going just getting out of um, uh, engineering school and been drafted into the French-Algerian conflict. Um, so Alan went to Algeria, in North Africa, and learned the job of being a, a infantry platoon leader. Uh, not knowing anything, he had to learn fast again and became an elite officer uh, is something that he never thought he would become. But he witnessed many atrocities. He was in combat and uh, went back home, which was good. <laughs> but having survived, he faced a very difficult re-entry into a civilian world that he no longer comprehended and uh, later found out that PTSD was exactly what was ailing him. And Never Give Up is the title of the third book. And that is against Alain, uh, years after the end of the Algerian war, he still suffered from PTSD and um, battled his inner demons still inside him and he eating at him and disturbing his life. And with the help of a woman he fell in love with, they worked together to defeat the evils and um, help him achieve inner peace. And that um, is not a recipe for people who have PTSD but it's a way to learn that indeed you can fix it. So, so those are the two books of the trilogy. And it's essentially the three books shows how devastating war is for children and all innocent bystander and as well as for the participant, the soldiers. Okay. One, one other uh, reader, uh, one other uh, viewers, this comes to, uh, so uh, what inspired you to write these books and what do you hope readers take away from When Paris Was Dark and your other books? Well, um, what inspired me to write, write the first book is because I talked about it to people, I said, well, you should write it. And so I did, but the other books, uh, the second book, uh, about the war that uh, I participated in Algeria, I didn't want to write. And the person who inspired me and guided me in doing it is uh, my mentor. Um, and uh, uh, she um, talked me into writing it. And it was a wrenching experience because I had to relive those two and a half years of, uh, of war in, in uh, North Africa. And uh, George Sweeney is her name, who taught me everything I know about writing, uh, says it's going to be good for you to write it. And, and indeed, um, a lot of things that I had never, never talked to anybody about for years and years and years, I wrote them in the book, and then I could talk about it and I guess it was uh, it was a good thing for me and you're also writing a um, working on a fourth book which is a little bit different um, it's totally fiction um, you want to mention that yeah well um, Judy is working and on the 
publishing that book and uh, Bruce, her husband, is uh, going to do the cover and we are, I'm, I'm excited about that, that uh, this is uh, a fiction uh, which is based uh, on, on the background of, of uh, being in Algeria uh, about a, a young girl who has uh, uh, orphaned and, uh, and in big trouble in her village and that uh, Alain saved and uh, it's a story you know who would would um, what happened to her and I followed uh, uh, Joy Sweeney is my uh, mentor and coach uh, principal which says if you write fiction just throw the cat out of the window just make write a story whatever comes to mind so I had a great time of writing it and trying to figure out from one day to the next what is it that's going to happen to that little girl and i found out and so it was fun another well, quick, a question in the chat forgive me judy um your books have so much detail sights sounds and taste how did you remember all of that you know uh, that's very interesting because if, if you you know people say your first book is not a memoir because you were too young to uh, to remember it and my answer to that is okay but let me tell you when you're being strafed by a uh, dive bomber with a lot of noise of course you remember it because you're frightened to death but when you remember traumatic events you remember where it was what happened what it sounded like what it smelled like everything all your senses when you're traumatized all your senses are affected and that is what ptsd comes from it is why memory comes from and this is why i can tell all of the details okay well i just want to say i'm glad you survived two wars and the technical technical difficulties of zoom and event rights to tell us your share us your your story with us and um i will give it back to patricia yeah it's a vote if you want thank you so much okay so um ladies and gentlemen um it, in the chat has also been placed the um links where you can purchase the three books oh, on Eve's, Eve's website so if you have a chance to look thank in the chat those will also be shared on our website so that you can enjoy these again. And um, this is not our, our, our only effort with authors. We have some very interesting opportunities coming forward. We'll be in John Knox Village for a very um, special author book show on October 22nd. That's a Friday coming up in 2021. And are just about to announce a date for a full book fair in downtown Fort Lauderdale in January of 2022. So we're just so excited to find these amazing people that live, they're our neighbors, they live in South Florida and have the most amazing stories to tell. So I hope you're enjoying this as much yeah, as we are and that you will um, continue to join us. Our author next yeah, month is Joe Knetchy. Joe is um, uh, one of two very famous Fort Lauder Florida historians. He's in Tallahassee. He's published a new book and we'll be on with um, our uh, chief curator, Rodney Dillon, who's also an author, who will um, be uh, chatting with Joe about that new book on Florida history. So that should be fun. And that's the second Thursday of July at noon during lunchtime. So I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I'm Patricia Zeiler again from History Fort Lauderdale. Hope you take some time to come and visit our exhibits and please continue to join us for these wonderful opportunities to meet our local artists. Thanks so much. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Eve. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.